Hello, and welcome to Rosio Christi Television. What is the history of the euthanasia problem? That's what I'm gonna be asking my next guest in this episode. Rosio Christi is a Campus Apologetics Alliance. We set up Christian apologetics clubs on university, college, community college, and high school campuses throughout the United States and internationally as well. However, we're not just reaching students. We actually have a, a area of our ministry called Rosio Christi Professor, or RC Prof. Rosio Christi is connecting with professors who are confessors. Those are Christian professors who, as Christians and as professors, influence the next generation on their very own school campus. These are Christian professors who are able to reach and disciple your child and grandchild, regardless of what school they happen to be going to. These Rosio Christi profs are people who talk about how being a Christian not only influences their vocation as a professor, but also in the specific field that they have a PhD in. Just go to rashiochristi.org, over to the top, click on RC Prof to find out more about that and how you can get connected if you are a professor anywhere throughout the world and a Christian. You'll be able to find out more about that. The purpose of Rashio Christi is to help make people aware of the evidence for the Christian worldview and appoint people to truth with a capital T. And that's what we call our program, Truth Matters. Joining me is Dr. Richard Weikart. Dr. Weikart is a professor of modern European history at California State University, Stanislaus, and an author of six books, including The Death of Humanity and The Case for Life. You need to get this book if you don't have it on your shelf already. Maybe get a couple copies and give one away. But this is talking about a very vital topic that we cannot cover, of course, in this episode uh, that's just about a half hour long. But in this book, uh, he shows the way that secular philosophies have eroded the Judeo-Christian sanctity of life ethic. This book, together with other books that he has written and art articles, includes considerable discussion of the history of euthanasia. Dr. Richard Weikart, it's great to have you back here on Truth Matters once again. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tony. This is a, a vital topic. Uh, you've written a lot on it. You have a book. You have a bunch of articles. Why was euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide prohibited, prohibited in Western culture until recent, recently, historically? Yeah, well, mainly this has to do with the Judeo-Christian tradition, which, of course, was going to dominate European thought for centuries from late antiquity up and through the Middle Ages and on into the early modern period and then on even into modernity. Uh, and the Christian position was, from the very earliest phases, very opposed to most forms of suicide. There were a few exceptions made by some uh, Christian uh, thinkers in the early period, but even most of them rejected anything like uh, suicide for reasons of suffering, and so physician-assisted suicide was in act completely condemned. So when you come into the period uh, of the medieval and early modern period, just about every major uh, country in Europe banned suicide, and sometimes they even banned it in, pretty, in ways that were considered pretty... Uh, horrible later on, such as by uh, seizing the property of the uh, person who had committed suicide, which ended up punishing the heirs more than the uh, obviously the person that committed suicide. But in any case, it was banned throughout Europe and also in the United States. When the United States was founded, uh, every uh, state in the United States uh, did, or excuse me, I should back up and say that, that the states continued the common law tradition of England in uh, prescribing suicide and certainly assisted suicide. Now, what happened in the, in the United States very early on, though, is that many of the states began uh, rejecting the idea that they should punish the heirs, so they removed some of the laws that punished uh, suicide, uh, because obviously if the person's successful suicide, they've already died. Uh, but that wasn't because they thought suicide was okay. It was simply because they didn't want to punish the heirs rather than the person that had actually perpetrated the crime. And they continue, many states continue to have prohibitions against physician-assisted suicide. In fact, every state in the United States, uh, well, I shouldn't say that right, uh, actually, because some were common law, but uh, most states in the United States banned uh, physician-assisted suicide until fairly recently. The 1990s was the only 
uh, beginning of a few states who began to allow physician-assisted suicide. So until recently, it was banned pretty much across the board in the United States and most of Europe. Now, since that was the case, when and why did euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide become acceptable uh, to some pe to some people, I should say, not everyone, but to some people in Western culture? Yeah, well, actually, until the 1860s and 1870s, there were no serious proposals uh, for uh, physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. There were proposals for suicide before that time. In fact, it was really the Enlightenment period that was going to be the, the key turning point there. Uh, during the Enlightenment period, some authors, such as David Hume, the famous British empiricist philosopher, argued that suicide was uh, morally okay, uh, but he wasn't talking about physician-assisted suicide at that point. It was just suicide. In medical ethics, it was still not tolerated for physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia until the 1860s or 70s. And interestingly, the way that debate opened up was actually by people promoting euthanasia uh, the killing of people in that time, particularly of people with disabilities, specific, especially infanticide, but also people, other people with disabilities at the time. And it really wasn't even a little bit later that they began uh, discussing physician-assisted suicide as such at that point. So there was a lot of talk in the late uh, 19th century and early 20th century of killing people with disabilities even, uh, which is not quite what we think of today when we think of uh, physician-assisted suicide per se. The reason for this shift in thinking by the 1860s and 1870s was because of growing secularization within the European intellectual context. Uh, also, Darwinism played a very key role. In fact, uh, two of the main authors who've written about the history of euthanasia, Nick Kemp, who's written about the British euthanasia uh, movement, and also Ian Dowbiggin, who's written the, the best uh, historical book about the American euthanasia movement, they both agree that Darwinism played a very key role also in the thinking about uh, death and uh, the struggle for existence, and uh, again, what uh, people who defined uh, people with disabilities who were defined as quote unfit at the time. And what role did eugenics play in the history of euthanasia? Well, as I just suggested, the people with disabilities were targeted as being so-called inferior or people who were unfit in these early phases of uh, the euthanasia movement. And the eugenics movement was a movement to try to, to maybe put it a little crassly, breed better people uh, to improve human heredity by various kinds of means. And so euthanasia was seen by some people in the eugenics movement, not everyone, there were many people in the eugenics movement who rejected euthanasia and who thought that the way to get there was by compulsory sterilization or marriage uh, prohibitions or other kinds of, of ways to hinder people with disabilities reproducing. But there were actually, there was a, a significant element within the eugenics movement in the 1890s and early 1900s especially who did propose that euthanasia was a way to improve human heredity. Let's you know, just kill the people who have disabilities uh, and then they won't be able to reproduce any longer and pass on what they saw as their inferior traits. Now, how have the attitudes toward people with disabilities shaped the debate over euthanasia and physician-assisted suicide uh, over these last few decades? Okay, I think I've suggested to some degree how it was shaping the debate in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century, but of course it's, all, it's still shaping the debate, in fact, because many of the people who are being targeted for physician-assisted suicide are people with some kinds of disabilities. Now, a lot in the United States, a lot of the physician-assisted suicide laws are stipulating that people have to be in the last six months of some kind of terminal illness, which, by the way, is impossible to determine when, when they're really in those last six months, which is why there actually are some people in Oregon who have had the prescriptions for physician-assisted suicide for one or two years already, even though supposedly it was supposed to be given in the last six months. But these, even with terminal illnesses, we could define this, I suppose, as disability. But the problem is that, too, if you look at other countries that have uh, legalized physician-assisted suicide outside of the United States, especially in Belgium, for example, or the Netherlands or Switzerland, uh, people with disabilities, be, and, and Canada now too, by the way, also has physician-assisted suicide. In these countries, people with disabilities are especially vulnerable and especially feel targeted. 
And in the Netherlands and Belgium, uh, you don't have to be in a terminal illness. There's, they've sort of left it a lot wider open for people who have what they just refer to as in unbearable suffering. That's one of the terms that's used and to describe those that are being targeted for uh, physician-assisted suicide there. And there are people who are being uh, given physician-assisted suicide in these places who have psychiatric illnesses as well. So they're suffering from depression. They're suffering from various kinds of psychiatric illnesses. So people with disabilities are special targets of physician-assisted suicide and uh, euthanasia uh, in the various countries as we see being practiced uh, and uh, could be susceptible in the United States as things develop as well if we keep moving in the same direction that uh, Netherlands and Belgium is moving. Dr. Weichler, I want to take a moment to let our audience know an, another topic that you are a scholar on, and that is uh, Nazi Germany, uh, the Third Reich, and Hitler. And I want to let people know about your other book, a uh, more recent book, uh, Hitler's Religion, which I suggest that they get as well in addition to uh, the book that we're talking about today because of the euthanasia. But this ties into this next question that I have for you, and that how did the Nazi regime justify their so-called euthanasia program? They justified it largely along the lines of both eugenics. So we already mentioned this, that they were trying to— one of the Nazis' key goals was to uh, improve the human species. Uh, and so, you know, we look at Nazism and look at the horrors of what they did, but Hitler and his cronies were convinced that what they were doing was going to make humanity better, that they were going to improve human heredity. Uh, and one of the ways to do that was to— get rid of those people that they had identified as inferior. or And it wasn't just the Jews. In fact, the first mass killing, the first attempts at genocide by the Nazis was against people with disabilities. Uh, in October 1939, Hitler gave a directive which allowed for what he called in the directive mercy killing for people with disabilities. That program began in January 1940, when they set up killing centers in various parts of Germany, they ended up setting up six of those over the next year and a half, where they killed over 70,000 people with disabilities. And they be, so this industrial-style killing of the Nazis that we know about that was going to take place later on in Auschwitz and Treblinka and the other uh, death camps was actually begun by killing people with disabilities. The other way that they justified this was simply by... Uh, sort of crass uh, budget analysis. You know, these people cost us money. And if you look at the Nazi propaganda during the time, uh, the they would actually have uh, posters that would talk about how much, how many marks it would cost to keep an institutionalized person for a year. And also Nazi textbooks actually had, math textbooks actually had word problems trying to solve how much it would cost to keep a, an institutionalized person alive you know, over the course of their lifetime or something like that. And so the idea here was to sort of get the German public uh, and young people especially uh, understanding that, hey, this is costing us a lot of money. Maybe we should try to find a way to get rid of this so-called problem, uh, which was these people who were institutions. So the Nazis saw their program, which was known as the T4 program, of uh, killing people with disabilities as a way to both uh, get improve the human species and also to save a lot of money. And if we think about, by the way, what's going on today, this same cost-benefit analysis does figure into discussions about physician-assisted suicide today. It's not surprising that some insurance companies have jumped on board with physician-assisted suicide because it saves them a whole lot of money rather than having to treat people with terminal illnesses and and pay for the hospitalization and all these other kinds of things. And we can also see that today as well, and there, this is a thing that many bioethicists caution about, that physician-assisted suicide uh, can also be uh, sort of imposed upon people by their own guilt feelings about, you know, all the resources that their family and their society is putting into them. And, well, maybe I should just save, you know, my, save the, uh, funds that are being spent on me, so to speak. So the person sort of guilt feelings about that. Or from the opposite side, you know, people wanting to promote physician assisted suicide saying, saying, look, we'll save all this money. And that is a that is actually a a, a way that people today are promoting it. So I see some parallels in the in the I'm not saying that people today promoting not 
promoting physician-assisted suicide are Nazis. That's ridiculous. But there are parallels with the things that the Nazis were saying and what are being said today. Dr. Wachar, people commonly say that hindsight is 2020. What draw? What lessons can we draw from the Nazis' euthanasia program? Well, I think we can draw a couple of lessons, and one I think that's most important is that once you start uh, devaluing some people's lives, in other words, teaching that some people are inferior and some people are superior, that you're making a very dangerous move. And it's the same move that I see happening today among people that are pressing for physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia. And because what's happening is uh, they are defining certain people as having lives that are no longer worth living. And by the way, that's the exact term that the Nazis uh, were using, uh, banding about quite a bit. It was an, a term that was invented actually in the 19, early 1920s uh, by a psychiatrist, prof a psychiatric professor and a law professor named uh, Carl Binding and Alfred Hoche, who wrote a book in which they dubbed people with disabilities as lives not worth living. And so this knife of life not worth living uh, that's the notion that's coming back to us, and as we devalue people's lives, and in our in the United States, again, it's people who are in terminal illnesses with less than six months to, to live, we're saying to those people, well, you know, your life really isn't valuable enough that we're going to protect it. Your life is not, is, is in fact, not only will we not protect it, but we will help you commit suicide. It's not just that we're allowing you to commit suicide. I mean, people can commit suicide all the time, uh, and, you know, we... All, we can't always do something about it, although usually, especially if it's a young person, we have all sorts of suicide prevention programs. You know, they built all sorts of barriers on the, the Golden Gate Bridge to keep people from committing suicide. So, you know, with young people, we do everything we can to try to stop them from committing suicide. But when it comes to people with terminal illnesses, we suddenly say, oh, wait a minute, your life isn't really valuable anymore. And again, that's, I think, the lesson we can draw, because that's a, the Nazis drew the line at different places then we are drawing the line today. But I think it's dangerous to draw the line at all. I think we need to say that all human lives are valuable. They all have purpose and meaning, and we should be doing everything we can to try to give a person the most meaningful life possible. We should be caring for them in the best way that we can, not trying to help them kill themselves. And when you're talking about these lessons, uh, some people will respond will saying, well, this is just the, the you know, old slippery slope uh, argument. But do you think that bringing this up, um, th this has any merit? I mean, do you think it is a legitimate slippery slope argument, uh, which definitely does have merit? Well, I think there's two ways the slippery slope argument actually does have merit. And I, I actually was kind of hesitant about this argument when I sort of started my research and was thinking about this. I thought, well, you know, there's no really logical uh, – uh, it, it doesn't logically tight that just because you promote – you know, one kind of physician-assisted suicide. Like, let's say, for example, the law that's in place in the United in the states in the United States, in Oregon and Washington and California, where you have to be in the last six months, you have to be have a terminal illness, you have to, so, and has to be requested by the person. So we've got this. It, there's supposed to be all these safeguards that are in place in California and Washington and Oregon and. And uh, so these and these are the states that are in the United States that have the the uh, physician-assisted suicide laws. So, and by the way, still most United States don't have physician-assisted suicide laws. It's still illegal in most uh, of the United States. But uh, in those, even in those situations, it may not be logically consistent that it, it would move from one to the other. But the reason I think that the slippery slope argument works is because once you draw the line to say that not everyone's life has value, then there's no real clear line to draw any longer. So for example, in California, we have six months, has to be terminal illness, but the question is, well, why is that? Why is it six months? Why isn't it eight months? Why isn't it a year? Why isn't it two years? There's really no clear line to be drawn any longer once you decide that some people's lives are not valuable and some people's lives can be ended. Uh, pretty much you uh, have to keep going along that uh, you can move along that slope in various ways. The other reason I think that the slippery slope argument works is not just because of the logical problem of trying to draw any other kind of line, but because we've seen historically that that's the direction that things move. If you look at Belgium, you look at the Netherlands, you look at Canada also, which recently uh, has 
uh, legalized physician-assisted suicide, it seems that once you cross that line, things do start opening up. You do start allowing more and more. You start allowing people at younger and younger ages. Now minors uh, in the Netherlands can uh, uh, have physician-assisted suicide. You begin allowing people with psychiatric illnesses rather than just physical illnesses. You begin allowing all sorts of other things. So once you open the, the door, it just seems like it, it moves uh, to larger and larger uh, spheres, and it doesn't seem to be contained. The reason I think that it's still contained in the United States and it hasn't moved further down along that slippery slope yet is because most of the states in the United States still have it illegal, and the physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia lobby in the United States recognizes that if they pushed harder in California and Oregon and Washington, where they, or Oregon's where they've had the law, law in the place the longest, if they pushed stronger in Oregon, they would lose the chance in other states who would be scared off by opening it up to other things. So I think it's just a strategic thing that Oregon and Washington, which have had physician-assisted suicides longer, don't haven't moved even further in that direction. But I would predict, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping that it doesn't move this way, of course, and I'm warning against it, but I would predict that if all of the United States you know, begins adopting physician-assisted suicide laws, after a while, the, physician, the, the, the uh, euthanasia lobby is going to push for euthanasia, which is mean, means doctor-administered Sui, uh, killing, as well as uh, non-voluntary euthanasia. Those things will become on the table as well. And what are the prospects uh, for legalization of physician-assisted suicide? Uh, do you think there are in the coming in the coming years? I mean, next year, five years from now, ten years from now. Well, the uh, over the of course, I mean, I'll, let's restrict the United States here, uh, of course, since that's where we're at and, and mostly. Well, I guess you're broadcasting the, uh, worldwide, uh, but I'll stick to the United States here. Canada, Belgium, the Netherlands, the Switzerland already have physician-assisted suicide. They're some of the few countries that actually do have it already. Uh, I haven't heard about any European countries or Asian countries right now that are uh, that there's seriously proposals for. Britain, it's continually been pushed back, so I don't see it coming in Britain uh, anytime soon, but it's they're continuing. To, uh, the There is a lobby there that's trying to push for it. In the United States, California is the latest state and, of course, the largest state in the United States that has physician-assisted suicide, so we have seen a pretty recent move. California just got it uh, less than two years ago, uh, began physician-assisted suicide. Uh, Oregon and Washington, Oregon's the, the longest standing with having had it over 20 years here. Uh, the good news from my perspective, since I'm obviously opposed to physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia, the good news is that most of the states that have tried to uh, have laws passed on physician-assisted suicide in the last several years, with the big exception of California, have struck it down. And there's a number of reasons for this. Uh, for one thing, Many physicians are very wary of physician-assisted suicide. I mean, physicians until the 1990s were, were completely opposed on the whole. Uh, again, there were exceptions here and there, and some of those exceptions were people who uh, did participate once it was legalized. Physicians are largely opposed. There's also uh, the Catholic Church is very staunchly opposed to it. Many conservative evangelicals are staunchly opposed to it. But even a lot of secular people are opposed to it because of the possibilities of abuse, uh, because of the alternatives such as pain management, hospice. There's, there's growing numbers of alternatives uh, to uh, what some people see as uh, lives racked in pain at the end of life. And by the way, let me just say this too about that, that uh, one of the big pitches that people make for in, in favor of physician-assisted suicide is that you know it's because of all this horrible pain that people are suffering at the end of life. Uh, but interestingly, if you look at Oregon, statistics show that most of the people in Oregon who get physician-assisted suicide are not doing it because of unmanageable pain. They're doing it because of fear of losing autonomy or fear of not being able to do things that they have enjoyed doing or uh, feel that, that would make their lives fulfilled. So it's not a matter of pain in many cases, but that's the pitch that's always being made about unmanageable pain. Also, pain management is becoming better and better. Palliative care is improving as time goes on. So that's going to become less and less of an issue as well. So there's a lot of things that are, there's a lot of headwind that the physician-assisted suicide and euthanasia is facing, which makes me confident that most states in the U.S. are not going to entertain seriously proposals to change the laws uh, there. But 
again, uh, it's hard to know in the, the long run. It's, I think it's going to depend a lot on uh, attitudes that people have toward death, toward uh, the value of human life. Uh, and I'm, I'm hoping that I can contribute as well as you and others out there can contribute to uh, keeping uh, physician-assisted suicide not only contained to where it's already contained, but hopefully rolling it back in the states that it's already there. I don't see that. I don't see it being rolled back uh, anytime soon in the states where it's already in position, but I'm hopeful in the long run that that will happen. Dr. Weicker, I have about one minute left, but I want to ask you a, 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 a question about a practical situation that some people may be in. Uh, is there a significant difference between turning off a respirator and giving someone medication that will kill them? Medical ethicists throughout the uh, 20th century, up until the time that physician-assisted suicide is being legalized, almost uniformly drew a distinction between those. It's the distinction between letting a person die and making them die. I mean, think about the difference uh, here that what, what is it that caused the death? Okay, if you turn off a respirator, what caused the death of that person? Well, their lungs weren't functioning. Their body wasn't functioning, and they died of whatever the the problem was that was causing them not to respire. They died of a disease. They died of illness. If you put an injection in there, uh, into them that killed them, that injection is what killed them. It's not the, it's not the uh, underlying disease. And by the way, very interestingly, uh, in, country, in most of the states that have physician-assisted suicide, on the death certificates, they actually list as cause of death whatever the illness is, not the narcotic that's given to them, the barbiturate that's given to them to kill, actually kill them. So there's actually some deception being involved here in the physician-assisted suicide. They're actually claiming the person died of an illness rather than died of uh, an overdose of drugs. Dr. Weichart, it's always a blessing to have you here on Truth Matters. Thank you so much for your time and informing our audience about the this vital topic. And, uh, and uh, just even that right there, I know there are people out there watching right now who are in this situation or may be sometime in the near future. Thank you so much for being on Truth Matters once again. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tony. appreciate it. Friends, when we look at the available evidence, we find that the Christian worldview aligns with reality. We need to think about our need for a Savior. Salvation is found only in the Lord Jesus Christ. Please be reading your Bible and also get Dr. Richard Weichart's book, actually both books, the one on Hitler's religion, as well as the one that we just talked about in this particular show on euthanasia. Great, uh, great resources. Get these. Uh, share them with other people as well. Get a couple copies. Give them away to a family member, friend, neighbor, coworker, whoever. People need this information. And also check out rashochristi.org. You can find out more about this great ministry and how we're glorifying the Lord, we're proclaiming the gospel, we're defending the historic Christian faith. Please support this ministry financially and pray for us that will allow this vital work to continue. And remember, when it comes to what we believe and why we believe it, truth matters.